what it talents, what it talents, what it do. Like I said, I am so glad to be here because, you know, as a pastor and as we pray for our congregation and as we're called to steer you in these times, you know, looking at the end times, like I said before, when I look at the events that are going on in the world, on social media, when I hear the multiple terrorist type of shootings, the wars, the hatred, the, the, the political unrest, the financial inflation, when I I see all these trouble and hard times, our heart goes so much out towards our people because we don't want you to faint. We don't want you to quit. We don't want you to cave in, but we want you to hold on and be a part of this end time army that God is raising us up to be. There are people waiting on the other side of us not quitting. There are people waiting on the other side of us enduring and outlasting and coming out with the victory. Amen. They need to look at your lives and say truly there is a God truly there is a Jesus truly this word does work amen and so looking I mean you got to know these are truly the birthing of the end times these are hard and difficult times Timothy tells you in 2nd Timothy he says to understand this that in these last days dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come difficult days that will be hard to bear and as we're right in it if you read Matthew 24 the whole chapter you'll see we're right in the middle of preparing in the end times but yet the end hasn't come but yet these are the birthing pains I mean Matthew lets this lets us know there's going to be a great falling away from the body of Christ that because of the hard and difficult and troubled times persecution and affliction many shall get offended and no longer want to serve Jesus no longer want to follow Jesus no longer want to hear the word preached to them any longer but they'll draw back and begin to hate on one another it's a time of the end times hard and difficult times but the praise God for Apostle Paul who had to endure hard and difficult times to reach to preach this gospel to us to write down almost two-thirds of this New Testament to get it to us so that we won't quit so that we won't grow weary he understood how to tap into the enabling grace to endure hard and difficult seasons I mean he lets us know when you're in this race that God has called us to to be able to not faint to be able to not quit but to tap into this enabling grace this this power of endurance we must keep our eyes on Jesus we must remember everything he went through the the the, the persecution the insults from sinners the grievous assault the whipping the the nailing to the cross him giving his life in the struggle against sin why for us to him taking on sin, him taking on every sickness and disease in his body. Why? For us. Him going to hell in our place, being tortured. Why? For us. And then him rising with the victory. Why? For us. Don't lose sight of Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus so that you can tap into this power of endurance so that you won't cave in, that you won't quit and give up. And be a part of that great following away. But he also makes it clear, in order to do that, we're going to have to lay aside every weight and sin that so easily trips us up. The only problem is, you need to know this, weights and sins are warring against you aggressively to not be laid aside. Do you realize Matthew lets you know in 2410 that the great falling away came because they became offended. What happened? Those that fell away lost the war against laying aside the sin of offense. And it resulted in them no longer wanting to follow Christ. 
So if you're ever going to get the victory in laying aside weights and sins, you got to understand that there is a war going on on the inside of you. There is a war within, a war between the flesh and the spirit, a war, a battle that's going on between our flesh and our spirit. You've read in the book where Paul says, when I want to do right, I seem to do what's wrong. There's a constant struggle when you make up your mind, I'm going to do the word. There's something, your flesh, the mind of the flesh telling you, no, you don't feel like reading the Bible now. Turn on the TV. You know you're tired. You can do it later. When you make a decision to diet for your health, there's your mind of the flesh saying, no, I got to have that ice cream. No, I got to go out and get that fast food. There's a constant war between the flesh and the spirit. In Galatians 5, 17, and I want to read this in the voice. It says, for everything the flesh desires goes against the spirit, and everything the spirit desires goes against the flesh. There is a constant battle raging between them that prevents you from doing the good you want to do. A constant battle. It never stops. Offenses will always come. Not if they come. Luke lets us know they will always come. You will always have an opportunity to wage war, if no more, against the spirit of offense, against the sin of being offended. To have the mind of the flesh is is to be offended. It's to be selfish. And we are raising up a generation that is really pushing us to be the most self-centered people. Everything's about selfies of ourselves and what we're doing and are we the latest and the greatest. There's so much competition to be the best and it's all about us. And the sad part is we're born selfish. That's just part of our characteristic. You ask a two-year-old. Mine, mine. Don't touch with my toys. Mine, mine. We got to be training them to be unselfish. But everything in the world right now is pushing us to be self-centered. It's about how I feel, what I want, what I think, what seems right to me. If it feels good, baby, I'm going to do it. That's the mind of the flesh. The flesh is prideful, it's envious, it's jealous, it's hostile, it's quarreling, it's manipulative, it's a compromising attitude. If you want a full list, then you need to turn to Galatians 5, 19 through 22. Check it out in the NLT to get the full list of the mind of the flesh. So it's a way where you want to take the easy road, the least resistant pathway. You know, you do not have to discipline yourself because you want to do whatever you feel. Someone's rude to you, you're rude back to them. You do not feel like having a good attitude, so you go around with a chip on your shoulder all day long. You know, recently, it's like when I went on a diet and I bought my pint of favorite Haagen-Dazs ice cream, and I said, oh, I'm just going to have a little bit. Just, just just two scoops of it. And when 30 minutes later, I demolished the whole pint. I never eat a whole pint of ice cream in one setting. But the moment I made a decision to go on a diet, I ate the whole entire pint within 30 minutes. There's a war going on, y'all, between the spirit and the flesh. Y'all laughing because you can identify with that one. You know, if we don't win this war, it will hinder us from tapping into God's enabling grace, his endurance power. We got to win the war to lay aside these weights and sins, and they're fighting not to be laid aside. If we don't win this war, we're going to be a part of the great falling away. We're not going to be amongst the number. And like I said last week, when we get before the Lord, we want him to say, well done. Not well. We don't want that. And what you got to understand, it is a constant ongoing warfare. You're going to, as long as you got breath within you, you're going to always have to deal with this warfare between the flesh and the spirit. But what's going to happen is you're going to learn to overcome it and level up, make progress. 
What am I saying? Five years ago, if you easily flew off the handle when someone disrespected you, five years later, you should be able to resist the urge of flying off the handle. I'm not saying the thought doesn't come. But you should be able to pause and breathe and say, no, I'm not tolerating that. I'm going to give a soft answer that turns away wrath. That's the difference. You know, five years ago, you get stuck in traffic. You might have been blowing your horn, barking, saying all kinds of curse words. We've got all kinds of cute symbols coming out all over your head of cuss words. But five years later, you should be getting stuck in traffic and not be cussing, not be bonking on the horn, not even have a thought of a cuss word coming up, but saying, let me just put in that that song or that teaching tape and just let me just meditate on that while I wait patiently. See, you got to understand the flesh always, always, always wants to rule. It always, always wants to have control. In Romans 8, 13, we read in the Amplified Classic, for if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will surely die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death, making extinct, deadening the evil deeds prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. You're going to experience that life and life more abundantly. See, I believe when they talk about living forever, they're not talking about just going on the glory. God says we should go from glory to glory, level to level. Amen? Amen. That he came to give us life and life more abundantly. So we should enjoy that abundant life here. And you got to remember, abundant life does not mean the absence of trouble. It's learning how to have peace and joy in the Holy Ghost in the midst of trouble because you know it is well in spite of what it looks like. And it's only a matter of time before this temporary situation lines up and changes. See, the flesh in Romans 8, 13, you see where it describes the, the flesh as a dictator. It says we, this is those who live by the dictates of the flesh. It's describing the flesh as a dictator. Do you realize in the real world a dictator makes all the decisions for you? Always telling the people what to say, what to do, how to do it, where to go. You just got to follow their orders. And it's the same way with the flesh. Like I said, if you're stuck in traffic, that dictator says, get upset. Curse a little bit. Then you're going to have your day messed up. Amen. How many of you had a Memorial Day cookout? How many of you know of relatives and friends who had one and they didn't invite you? How many of your flesh said, say what? They treated you like this? Don't speak to them anymore. And when you have your cookout, don't invite them either. (laughs) Let me tell you, unfortunately, many of us are following the dictates of the flesh like a good soldier. Yes, sir. Amen. I'm at at it the right way, sir. (laughs) But the problem is, if we keep giving in to the flesh, Romans 8, 13 says, it will kill you. You'll die. Your dreams will die. Your relationships will die. They won't flourish. Your gifts and talents that God has put on the inside of you, they're not going to come out like you want them to, and you eventually faint and quit and give up. You will not tap into the enabling grace of God's endurance power. You'll grow weary in your well-doing. You'll ultimately quit, cave in, and be a part of the great falling away. But I'm going to encourage you. You do not have to let the flesh win the war. You know, in Hebrews 12, where it talks about keeping your eyes on Jesus, it tells us you can win this because we haven't given our life against the struggle, the, uh, against, the struggle against sin like Jesus. You resisting sin hasn't cost you your life. That's why you can do it. You can win. Jesus gave his life against the struggle of sin so that we wouldn't have to give ours. He got our victory so we can win. 
So we can do all things through him. We have his can-do power. We do not have to let the flesh win the war. I'm here to tell you this morning, you can overthrow the dictator. And I plan to teach you how to overthrow him so that he will just have a whimper in your life and eventually a voice no more. Amen? So you got to take the flesh off the throne. You can't let it determine your decisions any longer. You got to realize with a dictator, you can't vote him out. You can't impeach him. You got to overthrow him. You got to treat your flesh like that. Stop playing with your flesh. Stop feeding it stuff that is inspiring you to sin. Stop feeding yourself stuff that's making you lazy and wanting to pick up extra weights and things. Stop doing it. You cannot play with it. You got to overthrow it. Amen? Amen. You know, if you want to get rid of a stray cat, you, you can't feed it milk every day and expect it to go. Tell it, no, I don't want you at the house, but yet you put out another bowl of milk and next day it comes back and you say, go, I cast you out. And the next day it comes back and you put out an, another bowl of milk. How many know if you keep that routine up, in about a week you're going to have a big fat cat sitting up on your belly while you're trying to tell it to go as you put another bowl of milk up underneath it? Well, your fat cat is the sin. It's the weight, and and, and the bowl of milk represents that TV show, that social media, that conversation that's filling you with, with energy to sin, filling you with lust, filling you with anger and hatred that is encouraging that behavior that you're trying to overcome. Makes no sense if you're dealing with a lust problem. My God, you almost can't watch nothing on television, not even the commercial, because all of it will feed that spirit. If you're dealing with an anger and attitude problem, why are you watching things where they're arguing and fussing all the time? I remember there was this, 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 this wedding show called Brazilla. Look, I, I can be evil and nasty and, and mouthy without needing the encouragement of watching someone be a bee. I can be my own bee without that influence. And I don't want that rising up in me when I get when, when my flesh is saying, I don't like what my husband's doing, my kids are getting on my nerves. I don't want that coming up in me so that I start acting and saying what they're doing on Brazilla. You got a problem with cussing. Why are you watching every rated R movie that's got so much profanity in it? And wondering why you keep cussing like, like, like it's your second language. Just being real in the house. (laughs) Romans 8.13 says you got to kill it. You got to forcefully remove it. You got to put it to death. Come with me to Colossians 3 and look at verse 5 in the message. It says, and that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it, grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of God. It's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and you didn't even know any better, but you know better now. So make sure it's all gone for good. Bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you're stripping off and putting in the fire. Stop right there. So what is it saying? Suffer your flesh to do the will of God. Do the right thing when it's hard. Bite your tongue when someone is rude. Stay faithful in your relationship when someone's trying to tempt you to be unfaithful. Glory to God. Just remember, the flesh is going to try to put up a fight. You got to be aware of this so you won't be surprised. Someone does you wrong and you choose to forgive, the flesh is going to have a fit and say, hey, wait a minute, we ain't taking that. No, we're going to get even. Don't let nobody dish you like that. That's the flesh. It's not going out without a fight. 
See, you got to start slapping those thoughts down. You got to remember it takes 30 seconds for a thought to become an emotions, and emotions are much harder to overcome than a thought. So as soon as a thought, your mind of the flesh starts talking to you, you start slapping it down. You made a decision to forgive, slap down the thought that I'm going to get revenge and say, no, I make allowances for other people's fault. I'm determined to think the best of them. I choose to forgive, and I have. Glory to God. Stop letting the flesh dictate to you how to live, how you respond, and how you'll handle adversity. Live the way the Spirit leads you, and you will overthrow the dictator. In Galatians 5.16, it says, So I tell you, live the way the Spirit leads you. Then you will not do the evil things your sinful self wants. So what does that mean? Clothe yourself daily. What are you saying, clothe yourself daily? Glad you asked. Come with me to Colossians 3, verse 10. I'm going to look at this in the message. It says, now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. You've been born again. You received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're now dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the Creator with his label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. You know, you've been recreated in the image of God. You are God's masterpiece, and he's made some new clothing, a new wardrobe for you. Let's find out what that new wardrobe is. So verse 12, so chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even-tempered, content with second place, Quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your all-basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Golly. See, when you read a scripture like that, you need to read that every morning before you leave the house. Because it says get dressed. You don't leave the house without getting dressed naturally, do you? Well, he just told you the wardrobe they want you to put on. You know, when you dress naturally, you select the wardrobe by the occasion that's coming up, by the weather, by the temperature of the environment. To avoid such such like this, to avoid accounting a mess on a rainy day, you dress for it. You wear galoshes maybe instead of your, 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 your satin high heels. See what I'm saying? Or your brand new leather loafers if it's going to be a downpour. You dress for the mess. To avoid being overheated on a hot day, you dress for it. Well, to avoid being overheated in your temper, t- in your temperament, why don't you dress for putting on love? Why don't you dress thinking the best of other people so that you will be prepared instead of in a hot place? See, as you dress in kindness, mercy, love, God's wardrobe, look at your day ahead of you through God's perspective. Look at the people you're going to encounter in their temperament and attitude. And look at the task at hand. Just don't get up and be so me-minded you don't even consider consulting with the Holy Ghost to prepare you for the day at hand. He knows what your day is going to look like. He knows who you're going to be talking to, who's going to get on your last nerve. And he will tell you how to appropriately dress yourself in his wardrobe and get your mind right before you leave out the house. See, understanding why each piece of God's clothing is appropriate and needed for the environment you're about to face by having a conversation with God. So what does this look like? When you awaken, make the decision to control your thoughts. Do not think on whatever comes to mind. Think positive, hopeful, and encouraging thoughts on purpose. The first 30 minutes of your day determine the mindset you will have. Don't get up looking at text messages and emails and and getting on social media. Put the word of God in your ears. Put the the first 30 minutes is going to control how your day is going to go. Control your attitude. Begin to see the best of others. Begin to determine, make a decision, I'm going to stay in peace. Control your emotions. 
Decide to forgive the wrong that could happen to you today. Decide before you leave the house to overlook the insult. Decide to give people the benefit of the doubt. Make this decision before you leave. It's important that you do this before you leave the house, that nothing will upset you and will steal your peace. See, this is dressing in God's wardrobe. Then when difficulties come, delays in traffic, when people are rude to you, when you experience setbacks, when, you're, when bad news comes to you, you have children problems, you are prepared instead of surprised. You're already clothed to overcome for the day, to overthrow the dictators. I'm telling you, you should always expect the best. I'm not telling you to go out expecting gloom, but you got to realize having an attitude to expect the best to be blessed, you better recognize there's a devil out here and he ain't rolling out a red carpet for you just to have a blessed and best kind of day, but you expect the best. Weapons will come, but you expect that they won't prosper because you've already put your wardrobe. You set your mind and your affections on God. Amen? You successfully clothe yourself so you can win the war within. And and it's easier when you do this to do this when you rule your atmosphere. See, some of you are having problems setting and putting on the wardrobe. I mean, first you didn't know to do this. But now as you're trying to do this, you got to make sure you're ruling your atmosphere daily. Like I said, it's hard to put on some, some, some kindness and thinking the best of everyone if I'm watching Brazilla and I'm letting everything that I thought I was wearing leak out because I watch and binge on programs like that and reality programs where they're cussing and, and doing all kinds of, you know, things of argumentative and I'm wondering why I'm, I'm just a big, you know, problem with my mouth why I'm argumentative, but yet I put my clothes on. You got to rule your atmosphere. You got to pay attention to what's going in your ear gate and your eye gate throughout the day. That's why it's hard to keep the clothes on. Look at Colossians 3, and we're going to verse 1. It says, if you're serious about living this new resurrection life, are you serious about living it? Are you serious, really serious about living this new resurrected life? Then act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorb with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ, that is, where the action is. See things from his perspective. In other words, daily keep your affections and your heart set on the things pertaining to Christ and not the culture of this world. You know, an alarm clock. It says, set your affections. That's what the King James and the Amplified says, says, set your affections. You know, when we set an alarm clock for a certain time, when that time comes, the alarm clock goes off at the designated time. If you set your affections on the things of God, when the environment and hard times and difficulties and offenses come, then you'll go off being with a right attitude. You'll go off in peace. You'll go off still thinking the best of others. You'll go off being able to overthrow the dictator when hard times and difficulties come because you have done what? Set your affection on those things that are above. You know, Proverbs tells us to tend to the word. That's how we have set our affection on those things that are above, to consent and submit to its saying, to not allow it to depart from your sight. Keep it before your eyes, your, your mind's eye. Keep it in your imagination. Never stop thinking about the word of God because it's life, health, and medicine to all your flesh. Proverbs 4.23 says to guard your heart with all diligence, but out of it flows the springs of life. In other words, be careful what you're thinking because your thoughts control your life. To set your atmosphere daily, you're going to have to rule your thoughts. When you do this, you'll overthrow the dictator. See, to rule your thoughts, to rule your atmosphere means you're going to not only rule your thoughts, you're going to rule your emotions, your attitudes by what you watch, by what you listen to, and who you hanging with. That's affecting whether or not the dictator is winning or whether you are winning by the Spirit of God. 
and your spirit is winning. So you got to guard your heart. Don't let everything in. Don't watch the news all day long. Don't hang with critical spirit. Don't you know spirits are transferable? If you hang with critical people, you're going to become critical. If you hang with judgmental people, you'll become judgmental. If you start hanging with unfaithful people, you're going to become unfaithful. Spirits are transferable. We don't rest, wrestle against flesh and blood. Come on, don't lose sight of that. The enemy wants you to think, please give me five more minutes on that clock. The enemy wants you to think that people are your problem. They are not your problem. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principality, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness, amen, and power. There is a demonic world out here that is attaching itself to people and that want those demons want to jump off those people onto you. So if they got a critical demon, that critical demon, demon wants to go home with you. If they got an unfaithful demon, that unfaithful demon wants to go home with you. And then if you're putting the wrong things in your eye gate, you're fueling it. That's why we're losing the war within. That's why the dictator is not overthrown. You know, I heard a testimony about a man that he had an hour drive to work, and while he drove to work, he listened to all of these debate kind of programs, some type of news station where they were argumenting, they debated the issue. By the time he got to work, he was so angry and disgruntled. He had this behavior all the time. None of his coworkers wanted to hang around him. Nobody wanted to be in his company. And he would do this every day he went to work. One day he was traveling to work, and he was switching to go to his channel, and he came across some preaching word, some word filled with hope and victory. And he began to listen to that thing. It so intrigued him that instead of listening to the debating and argument of news he used to listen to, he started listening to that every day. After a month, his demeanor changed. His attitude changed. He became kind. He became gentle. People wanted to be around him like a magnet is the metal. It eventually caused him to get promotion. What did he do? He changed what was going in his eye gate, in his ear gate. So it's important. Keep your atmosphere full of faith, full of hope, full of victory. Rule your atmosphere daily. We'll have you dressing for victory. Just controlling, it'll make it easy to wardrobe and love and kindness and, um, and, and forgiveness to think the best of others just by having the proper atmosphere. Don't forget, we're kings. We're called to reign in life, not the dictator. You the man, you the woman, you the king and queen. You the rule in life, not your flesh. We are the rulers. Amen. So you must decide if, if what I'm listening to and what I'm watching, is it building me up, making me more positive, more hopeful, or is it stressing me out, discouraging me, filling me with anxiety and fear, and making me angry? See, as I said before, this is affecting what you're dressing in for the day, whether it's bitterness or kindness, whether it's anger or love. You'll dress like what you associate with and hang around. So don't let people, the news, negative and immoral TV shows and social media poison your atmosphere. I mean, you heard my testimony before I was saved because I was in an emotionally and physically abusive relationship. I came in my marriage sad and discouraged and downtrodden after about a year into it. I was depressed. I was a person that nagged and I, I was critical and saw the worst before I saw the better. And I would go to work and I would work in an environment where the people were murmuring, complaining, and critical and unhappy because they didn't like their jobs and they were dissatisfied and I'd sit and listen in their conversation. I'd come home and I'd watch the news on television and I'd watch binge on TV shows, but yet I went to church on Sundays and during the midweek services, but I put more of the other stuff in me than that two hours of church on Sunday and that two hours of church midweek and that other hour of church on Friday and so forth. I had more hours of the TV, the news, and my eight hours of my coworker association. Then it reached a point in my life where I could tolerate the sadness and the discouragement and depression no more. And I said, I got to put something new in my eye gate and in my ear gate. 
I grabbed hold of some teaching tapes. I got a hold of listening to preach word on television because I would watch my husband the year before watching ministry that I would not avail myself to listen to. But after he had it on the television for a year, it finally resonated. Maybe you need to hear some of what he's listening to. The more I listened, the more joy came. The more I listened, I stopped watching the TV programs in the news station. The more I listened, I no longer hung around in the association of the murmuring and complaining on the job. The more I put the word in my eye gate and in my ear gate and listened to tapes on, on, on ministering hope and victory and encouragement, I began to get a new perspective. Instead of feeling hopeless, I saw hope. Instead of seeing the glass always half empty, I looked at it as half full. Instead of being the murmurer and the critical and judgmental person in my household, I became the encourager, the exhorter. I became from being a nag to having words of kindness. What was I doing? I was putting on a new wardrobe. How did I get the new wardrobe on? I changed my atmosphere. It so radically changed my life. Those new wardrobe that happened 30 years ago, that it so radically changed my life when I made a decision to rule my atmosphere, that I've been doing it every day since then 30 years ago. And here I am 30 years later being your encourager, being your exhorter, being kind, take, not taking offense from you guys, glory to God, or my children, or my husband, but being able to cast it down. I didn't say I didn't have an opportunity. I didn't say I didn't feel like it, but I've been listening to enough of the Holy Ghost and ruling my atmosphere. I've been wardrobing myself for what to expect, that I'm able to push a pause button and hear the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of me, settle my flesh, and help me win the war within and overthrow the dictator. I want to encourage you. Come on, overthrow the dictator. Begin to rule your atmosphere and begin to put on your wardrobe that God has given you daily and watch your life make great progression. Watch you progress with no limits. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is your time. This is your season. It's time to throw aside every weight and sin. It's time to put your eyes on Jesus so that you can tap into his power of endurance, his enabling grace. You're not going to be a part of the great falling away. You're not going to grow weary and just give up. You may be tempted to be weary, but you ain't going out, baby. You know what to do now to stay in the game. You know what to do now to stay in the race. See, as a pastor, I've given you the tools, but I cannot build your house for you. The doctor gives you the prescription for the, for the infection, but he can't go home and force it in your mouth. I am the, the sub-doctor of Jesus Christ. I've given you the prescription, the medicine of the word of God, but I cannot force you to put it in your eye gate daily. I cannot force you to put it in your ears daily. I cannot force you to keep it out of your mouth. I cannot force you to rule your atmosphere, and I cannot make you wardrobe in God's new clothing. You got to do that. Amen. Now go do it. Amen? Amen? Come on, let's give them praise in this house. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. And look, to help you to get your atmosphere ruled, you know our spiritual man, our father of this house, made a powerful con confession called Know Yourself. It will, it's 10 minutes long set to some upbeat music. So if you're feeling funky when you rise up, just the music ought to pick up your step. If you're feeling tired and lethargic, just the music before the confession start ought to get you going. But if you put that on as part of your first 30 minutes to rule your atmosphere, it'll set your mind for victory, for deliverance, to overcome and make progress with no limit. So what have we done? We put the thing on the, the screen. I forgot what you call it, amen. The barcode. If for those who don't know how to use this, look, one day, well, I didn't always know how to use this. Pull out your phone, pull out your camera and point it at You don't have to take a picture. Just pull out your camera like you're going to take a picture on your phone and an email will drop, a, 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 a Safari link will come up. Hit the link and it'll take you there. Amen. And you can take a picture because it will work even as a picture. I took a picture and it does work if you take another phone and look at that picture. But take that. 
You need that. You need those know yourself confessions. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Well, I hope you took that. You online, you, you taking a picture? Come on. This is your opportunity. Don't be ignorant now. Come on. You my children. My children ain't stupid. They're intelligent. Glory to God. Amen. Woo! And you're capable. Amen. Hallelujah. And powerful. Well, glory to God. Father, I thank you for this word that is going forth. I thank you that it will not fall to, to a side and come up void. But I thank you, Father, that it has landed in their hearts and it will bring forth a hundredfold harvest. That, God, they will win this war within and overthrow the dictator and make great prog progress with no limits. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're out there and you don't know Jesus, my God, that's where it all starts. How are you going to tap into the enduring power without Jesus being in your heart as your Lord and Savior? So I want to offer that to you. If you're here in the house or online, come on, let's receive Jesus. Let's get this thing going. So this is simple as saying this prayer after me, but believe it in your heart. And as a family, we do it to make the people feel like we're one. So everyone repeat, repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again from the dead for me. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for me. I give you my life. Come into my heart. I receive you this day as my Lord and my Savior. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you said that prayer for the first time and you meant it in your heart, you have just been snatched out of the power and the control and dominion of the devil and put into the kingdom of God's dear son. You're in the family of God. Amen. You got a chance at overthrowing the dictator now. Amen. You're no longer in agreement with it. So you got the power on the inside to overthrow him. So we would like to hear about this great decision you made. Can you connect with us through our Victory Connect number by texting hashtag VCMIDC to 22300? Even if you're in the house in person, this is our way to connect with you. Amen. So just text that Victory Connect number. It'll, you'll get a text link. Follow that link all the way through. And maybe you said, well, I, I, I um, got born again. And some of you saying, I don't need to, to be born again, but I need to re rededicate. Man, the war within. I've been whipped. I've been whipped. And I need some help. I need some scriptures. Well, it's a great time to rededicate. Like I said, the war within is ongoing. It will never stop. But you just don't want to be in the same place you was last year with the same behavior. And if you're seeing yourself struggling, that's no shame. You just need help, and we want to be here to help you. So if you like prayer to rededicate, also text our Victory Connect number. If you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you need that extra power to cause you to be able to win at life. And if you don't have a church family, come on, what are you waiting for? We welcome you to the household of victory in D.C., amen, or St. Mary's County. Come on, for any one of those four things, salvation, rededication, baptism of the Holy Ghost, or joining this great family, text our Victory Connect number, amen. <laughs>